everyone today in collaboration with the Canadian International Council. I'm also on the board. Chris, thank you, uh, President of the CIC, for agreeing to host this important talk. Um, for those of you who don't know, yesterday the Canadian Parliament voted uh, overwhelmingly to uh, resettle 10,000 Uyghur refugees to Canada. Um, strong support of the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, Montreal Member of Parliament Samir Azveri put forward this and was uh, got approval from all uh, all political parties, which is a rarity in yeah. Ottawa, to see all political parties agree on doing something right. So we're really pleased, timely, it's in the news, mm -hmm. and we're here today really to, to talk about the Uyghur human rights crisis, what can we need to do about it? Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, there's over a million or two million Uyghur Muslims who are being fully mistreated, a uh, case of genocide against them, structure of the cultural heritage here in China, as well as the long arm of the Chinese state that's uh, conducting transnational uh, repression, both in person and on social media. Um, we first had the pleasure to host uh, Dolkin here a few years ago, and the Chinese Consul General <laughs> to Montreal wrote to me and said, we have to have a meeting, you're hosting a terrorist. Mm -hmm. uh, I ignored his email, and the next morning we found out that he called the pressure on the mayor of Montreal about a week long mm -hmm. to shut down our event. Um, since they did that, we said, no, we don't like to be intimidated, we don't like bullies, so we ho hosted Dokin a second time, and I think now it's his third. <laughs> so I hope the Consul General got the me uh, message that we originally had our place where we're allowed to discuss human rights, contemporary issues, we give a platform to those who are working uh, on some of the most important pressing issues on the planet. So that being said, we have two very fine speakers with us. We have Bill Kanisa, who is the president of the World Leader Congress. Um, he just has a recent book came out. Don't have to say too much. You saw his bio. And we have Mehmet Todi, who's uh, a famed leader activist, who's been you know, very strong working with us in a couple of years. We met in DC, uh, but really glad to have both of you here tonight. Just to have you yeah. tell us about what is happening inform the wider Canadian public um, about, about, about what's happening and what Canadians can do. And I will say one last thing before I hand over the floor, is that this funny contraption here, the owl, is, is taking an image of all the speakers and it's being broadcast on all our social media channels, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. So if you're on Twitter, please go to Migs at, uh, uh, at Migs Institute, retweet that, let people follow online, and we'll then also share this event later on, we'll put it up on YouTube for those who couldn't attend, will be able to see what was discussed. So with no further ado, I'd like to give the floor, maybe Dokin, for you to start. Um, and then we'll go to Mehmet, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Okay, thank you, Carl, and thank you for your nice introduction. As Carl said, it is my first time, and here to the 19th first time, and uh, I brought a little bit of headache to him, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so and this, thank you, Pastor Hide. Uh, and this, this topic is uh, we will human rights crisis, and uh, yeah, what the Canada do actually is uh, this title I think a little bit light because it is already beyond of the human rights crisis. This is a genocide. Uh, so yeah, is Canada and Parliament is the first the Parliament uh, recognized Uyghur genocide motions. After that, uh, and the follow up to Canada now is 10 parliament recognized Uyghur genocide plus European Parliament. After Canada, uh, <clears throat> the Netherlands, then Belgium, then Czech Republic, then later French, UK, United States, and Ireland. Uh, yeah, then European Parliament, then French, is all recognized Uyghur genocide. And uh, as maybe some of you already heard, uh, Uyghur Tribunal. And one of the people tribunal was set up, Jeffrey Nice, who is the uh, very famous uh, lawyers and also a former prosecutor of the Milosevic, former Yugoslavia, uh, International Criminal Court. And uh, he, the World Uyghur Congress official, recused him to allegated uh, genocide, uh, Chinese government. Uh, and the committee against the Uyghur genocide, crime against the humanity, and all. So he set up uh, Uyghur tribunal. Uh, within 18 months, he collected 100,000 page document, uh, Uyghur tribunal, uh, and the pro bono tribunal, it is, of course. Uh, then more than 500 people's testimony, 
then 2021, December 9, uh, Uyghur tribunal uh, make judgment, Chinese government commit against Uyghur genocide and crime against of humanity. So before the Uyghur tribunal, Chinese government, of course, this is the CIA game, it's also Western correspondence, something that like all the time, uh, because uh, some parliament already recognized Uyghur genocide, that time also Chinese government attacks a lawmaker in the Canadian lawmakers, European parliament law law lawmaker 2021, European Union plus uh, UK, Canada, and uh, United States sanctioned four uh, high-level Chinese Communist Party officials uh, who link uh, this genocide. Uh, then Chinese government on the uh, 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 sanctioned lawmaker, some uh, and uh, uh, scholar as well. Uh, up to the Uyghur tribunal judgment, then it is the completely according to the international conventions and international law. Uh, this is not political decision; it is the legal uh, prospect. Everything is on the on the international uh, law. So that's why I'm saying this is not a human rights crisis; this is already genocide. It's a genocide. So actually, this the Uyghur uh, situation uh, today. Uyghur, uh, Uyghur has been uh, facing genocide. Uh, but most of them people thought this problem is just the start of 2016 or 2017 is a new case. Actually not correct. It is not true. This problem exists uh, since many, many years, since the 1949, since the Chinese Communist Army occupied East Turkestan. We call East Turkestan, China say Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region, this territory. So 1949, Chinese Communist Army occupied this territory. Then, and the, from 1949, this discrimination, assimilation policy of the Chinese government towards the Uyghurs has continually. Uh, yeah. Uh, but since the 2014, current President Xi Jinping talks to power, Chinese <coughs> government policy from assimilation, discrimination policy into genocidal policy. <coughs> so uh, we don't know exactly how many people today and the concentration camp because it is very difficult to get uh, information. But we estimate up to 3 million, at least 3 million Uyghur, Kazakh, and other Turkish speaking people are suffering concentration camp. Uh, until 2019, until uh, end of 2019, uh, this all uh, uh, is the people who stay in the concentration camp, detainer, just uh, subject to indoctrinate. Uh, and then denonist and forced denonist national and the religious identity shows the loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party and the Xi Jinping. Even if you drink some water, you have to uh, show the loyalty for the Chinese Communist Party. Oh, thanks for the Xi Jinping, thanks for the Chinese Communist Party. Without Xi Jinping, without Chinese Communist Party, no life, no water. You have to say this repeatedly. And also, area monitoring is a camera monitoring you even monitoring and you more emotion, you know. If you're not very cooperative with them, that's people and subject to uh, tortures, physical tortures. Yeah, and uh, since then, since 2019, some camp survivor was released from the camp because of the foreign citizen. Uh, it's not Uyghur background, some is Kazakh, some is Uzbek, uh, but most of them have a uh, 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 foreign uh, background. For some is a Kazakhstan citizen, some as a Pakistan citizen, all husband is Pakistan. That's why they were released. Then up they came uh, back uh, to the uh, uh, exile, then they are made testimony to the U.S. Congress, United Nations, European Parliament, and the other media. They are tell us horrible story, horrible. So many rape cases was happening to the women, you know, so many rape cases was happening. Uh, and the, uh, the forced to speaking is the Chinese, it is Uyghur speaking with Uyghur completely forbidden in the camp. Uh, yeah, and the 2019 Chinese government set up a uh, small factory inside the camp and the, um, near the camp, then used the Uyghur to the forced labor. Yeah, now is 25% uh, in cotton, kickstone. Uh, globally from uh, Uyghur first ever. This is not we are saying, this is the uh, international uh, uh, scholar and for use of um, China's source. This is the statistic, 25% uh, cotton and uh, all international brand 
a particular Adidas, Boss, every, every such an international brand, Nike, uh, use uh, Uyghur uh, Fostable Cotton. Uh, in China, 85% cotton textile from Fostable, Uyghur Fostable, yes. Yeah, then no is that these people used in the uh, 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 forced labor. And also Chinese government is since the 2016, uh, at, least, at least one million, one million Uyghur children separate from family. And that some, and the, uh, and the transport to the uh, other province of China, then change the name, forced it to speaking Chinese, and uh, because there's five, six years old children, then uh, the denominous uh, national identity are being Chinese. You know? Yeah. And of course, this Uyghur language, forbidden this Uyghur language, it is not new issue. When uh, it was the East Turkestan, because Mehmet, we are studying the same university. That time is teaching language is Uyghurs. Even today, according to the Chinese constitution, autonomous law, if you see, is Uyghur language one of the official language. If you see the Chinese money, five languages, one is Chinese, one of the Uyghur, one is Tibetan, one of the Mongol, even today, China is just show it all oh, over. We are respect the Uyghur language, Uyghur and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, education. But in the, this is on the paper. In the paper, but reality, 2004, uh, stop and use the Uyghur language, universal, university level. Then step by step, this from kindergarten to the university. No, even today, Uyghur children cannot speak uh, during the break time, use the mother tongue, and it will be punished. Yeah, this is the situation. This is not only according to the international convention, international law. It is against the Chinese own uh, constitution as well. But we went to the United Nations, and the next week, and the China uh, UN Committee uh, Economic, Cultural, Science, uh, so Social Right review Chinese report. Every time we raise this issue, Chinese government says it's lie because look at our constitution or autonomous law, Uyghur language and the official language, Uyghurs, Tibet, all can uh, receive education by the by, by language, uh, by language. But it is a uh, line because China trying to continue cheating and the internationally hiding the uh, reality. And uh, uh, actually CCP is, Another uh, important issue uh, we will uh, have been faced and the uh, religious freedom. According to Chinese constitution, uh, 36, Article 36, guaranteed everybody have a right, believe or not believe in religious. But today, people have a right, don't believe in religious, but not right, have a believe in religious. Particularly, the CCP is saying is a religious is Python, you know? Particularly is the targeting Islam. Islam is ideological illness, disaster, it must be eradicated. This is the official slogan by the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping. So that's why since 2015, 2016, forbidden all uh, fasting and the health care, you know, and the birth, everything. Yeah. And ev today, today, unfortunately, some countries is uh, and uh, some uh, uh, people and the burners of Quran or and uh, some uh, attack the Islamic value. All Islamic world stand up and understand, but CCP Chinese Communist Party burn and the 2017, 2018 very openly collected Quran, burning Quran, uh, but no single Muslim country stand up. The reaction was this against this. Is, this is the really unacceptable double standard. And uh, also, Australian National Institution, uh, Policy Institute uh, published report 2021. From 2017 <coughs> until 2020, within three years, 8,000 mosques completely demolished. And 8,000 mosques is partly destroyed. This is a user satellite image, everything that reported this. This is the 21st century is, uh, uh, happening, but China continually saying, and they sometimes organize propaganda tour from the Muslim country, Muslim journalists, mostly, and also the Muslim diplomat, and they use them to the uh, 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 propaganda tour. Just uh, uh, last month, uh, last month they did, they did, oh, we went to the, uh, the Xinjiang, everything, every, 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 everything is very normal. 
they have, they, they have a religious freedom, everything fine, because they have brought them and they, uh, used the, the Islamic scholar, sometimes Islamic uh, uh, Muslim diplomat to use the uh, 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 propaganda. Yeah, this is all. And uh, it is not only is the happening is it, uh, in the Turkestan, because most of them people saying is the talking about all these the people who stay in the concentration camp. But only okay, or, around three million people is uh, uh, suffering in the concentration camp. But another million of people, we believe we were around 20 million. China say 12 million. Anyway, 20 million, 12 million, three million in the concentration camp. Another uh, more than 10 million people is outside. But no one feeling is safe because no one know what will be happening next hours, next days, because you don't know. Everything is happening. Even you cannot ask the right why. Why you? Anytime no, uh, police knock your door, take you under the concentration camp, you don't have a right to ask any question. So that's why most of them people just talking about other people in the concentration camp. So, but uh, other people not in the concentration camp is also not safe because Xi Jinping already turned whole East Turkestan into the open air prison. Everyone is a prison. And we are living in exile. All family members is hostage. You know? Since 2016, I can say majority, most of some Uyghurs who live in exile lost the contact with family member. Only some heartbreaking news was happening at home. This news from us view some way. I personally last telephone communication my mother seven, 2017, beginning of April. Now it's already five years, so six years, six years, I have lost contact. But since the six years, several heartbreaking news, 2018 after, after all communication broken, after one year later, I got first heartbreaking news, my mother died. After I got this news, I tried to call to my family, but I couldn't access. I couldn't access. Then later, three, three weeks later, I learned from the Radio Free Asia, they are randomly calling to the police or uh, and the uh, local government. Then they reported my, my mother died one of the concentration camp. She was 17, 8 years old lady. She was not a political, political woman, or she was not just a pensioner as a housewife. 17 years late, I learned this heartbreaking news from the media, 2018. I learned this news up to three weeks later. My, my mother, in the, she was put in one of the concentration camp around one year, staying in one concentration camp, and she died. This is I learned from the media. 2020, I learned from Chinese Global Times, Chinese media. My my father passed away. But still, I have no idea where my, my father's cemetery is. Which condition he passed away is hospital, concentration camp, at home, or because of the age, because of the health, I have no idea still. 2021, I got other news from my uh, family. I learned this also from the, from the media. My younger brother, uh, he sentenced to life. And my older brother, he's a mathematics professor. He sentenced to 17 years. This is the, my family story. This is the news last five, six years uh, from my family. My, my case is not unique. All Uyghur who live in Syria, some of my countrymen sitting behind of this hall, and the Mohammed uh, Tohti, his family, maybe he will talk a little bit later. All Uyghur who live in, in the exile have the same problem. This is 21st century. Communication is not problem at all, but for us, it is a big problem. We cannot communicate it. Yeah, this is the, that's why we are saying this uh, title, uh, <laughs> Human Crisis with Light, this is uh, the uh, uh, current situation. Uh, yeah, this is happening. So that's why we are doing our job. We are traveling around the world. Uh, we are uh, doing rises issue, advocating, pushing the government uh, and the pushing the parliament to recognize more parliament, recognize Uyghur genocide. And the government also take concrete action. This genocide already started seven years, start 2016, 
now is the 2023, seven years. Yes, we have seen some, some uh, positive response from the internationally. Yes, last year, uh, October, United Nations, 50 country made joint statement. Yes, uh, it is good stuff, of course. 10, as I said, 11 parliament already recognized Uyghur genocide. Yes, uh, yesterday was Canadian parliament also on the, uh, approved is a uh, uh, Uyghur resettlement bill and motion. It is good, but it's not good enough because people are dying every day. People are suffering every day. You know? Unfortunately, most of some country, European country, United States, and the all continue to make business. It is not correct time business as usual, but unfortunately, the company still make business with China, because and the company uh, in the hunger for the money, of course, but you cannot, the company cannot make money of the blood of Uyghurs. People are dying. Yeah, this is the situation. That's why we continue <coughs> doing our job and uh, we need the help from internationally because we believe all country sign 1948 international convention on the uh, uh, genocide have a legal obligation to uh, stop uh, and the ongoing genocide. And all human beings, all companies have a moral obligation to stop ongoing genocide. Just speaking, just the talking is not good enough to stop. Should be take some action. Uh, so this is our wish. Uh, of course, we are doing our job, and but every human being, everybody have a, uh, can do something. Uh, so that's why we need your help and uh, your support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kyle, and thank you, uh, Canadian uh, International Council and other sponsoring organizations. And this is my, I think, third or fourth visit to Concordia University, and uh, you are doing a good job. And uh, let me just start uh, by reminding the, the tweet from Chinese Embassy in Ottawa, and it said, We urge Canada to respect these facts, stop politically manipulating Xinjiang related issues for ulterior motives, spreading disinformation and misleading the public. Okay, let's, for that reason, just straight up some facts. Who is misleading what? And so, my name is Mehmet Tohti and uh, I am the executive director of Ottawa-based Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, and our organization uh, does not spread misinformation, and we do research, and we do documentation. <coughs> At the same time, we do advocacy work on the basis of the documentation and the facts. And so, a couple of facts. Uh, maybe the Chinese embassy or ambassador and the embassy staff are watching us. And the last time we tried to reach them to ask questions at the University of Ottawa. And uh, the University of Ottawa, they refused our uh, entry to the building to ask that question. And they refused our access at the same time uh, with the, the instruction from the Chinese ambassador and they kicked out all the cameras. And so we were protesting, and even they could not tolerate our voice, and so we shut down the blinds. But our protest did not stop. And so uh, we, are, we are busy to straighten up the facts and remind the Chinese government to stop this misinformation and the disinformation in respect to facts. And so what is the facts? And I left my home country in 1991. And since then, it is 32 years. It is total isolation since then with my families and all direct or indirect relatives. And uh, the Chinese government did not allow any of my family members or relatives to come to Canada and visit me, or I cannot go back. So it is total isolation. For what? Just for me to speak up. I have a tongue to speak. I can write. That is the only two things I did in my life. I did not hurt a mosquito, that's it. And uh, the Chinese government for that reason, they punished the whole family, that is the fact. 
And this January 16, I have received a phone call from Chinese security officials by holding one of my uh, mother's brother in a hospital bed. And uh, I learned from that conversation that it is not even one month old, and I'm still trying to digest that information. And my two sisters died in a concentration camp. That is the fact. And my mother died in concentration camp. That is the fact. And I asked my three brothers, and the Chinese security officials said, we don't know. And how you don't know? Just tell me where are they, whether they're alive or not, alive or dead. That we don't know how about their children, how about their spouses. And so these are the facts. And we are not spreading any misinformation or disinformation. And I lost had a contact from my family members since October 23rd, 2016. Now it is almost six years, or seven years we are entering. And no information about any of my family members. None. Except that kind of phone call made by uh, Chinese officials from back home. Otherwise, my relatives or anyone else uh, do not have access to make a phone call to me. And the reason of that phone call is a number of things we did in Canada. One is the high tier, the deal that the RCMP signed with the Chinese tele uh, high tech companies, just giving all the contracts to provide the communication service for our government officials, including our prime minister. And we figured out that uh, the deal on August 31st, and we worked nearly for four months with our research team at the corner Hilly, and we tried to convince the media and the CBC just to publish that story. We put all the facts straight and the story published, and it was a big day in Canada that turned out to be a national discussion and a huge debate in the parliament, and finally government canceled it. And the Chinese embassy and the Chinese government was very upset because we are behind that deal, and it was the gateway for Chinese government to access all information, the, uh, the communication of our government officials with world leaders. It was a crucial information that the, 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 the Chinese government needed and the high tier was providing that information or providing that grant for Chinese government to have access to our internal communication. Very upset. And secondly, we are working really hard to pull out our public funds, especially care of the pension funds, invested in China on Chinese companies tied up with Uyghur genocide and Uyghur forced labor. The total amount is nearly $55 billion. And we are campaigning to convince the Canadian public and the politicians, of course, the CPPIV, just to withdraw those huge amount of public funds from China because it is not ethical and I'm a pension contributor and I don't like to receive my pension from the money they made out of genocide. It is morally unacceptable for me. And for that reason, we, we are standing up and we continue to stand up on this issue. And so Chinese government is not happy about that. At the same time, we are working with the universities because universities in government fund in Canada, including McGill, we don't know Concordia and the University of British Columbia, University of Toronto and all other major universities. They invested in Chinese companies directly tied up to Uyghur genocide. And we try to rectify this mistake. It is a crucial mistake and we cannot afford to make this mistake. And the Chinese government is really upset about it. And also a number of campaigns and uh, legal the campaign is we are advocating to pass the legislation to ban products made by the use of Uyghur forced labor entering Canada. And because we have a number of uh, obligations as a Canadians and the government of Canada to uphold. One is uh, as a provision of uh, USMC agreement or Kusma agreement, United States, Mexico and the, the Canadian free trade agreement. The old name is NAFTA. The Article 23. The bans all products made by the use of forced labor or child labor enter to the North American market. And the United States so far seized more than 5,000 shipments 
and a total worth of $1.4 billion. And in Canada, zero. And we keep our custom door open. And our market is dumping ground for products made by the user of Uyghur for slimmer. Solar panel, textile products, electronics, even fruits and vegetables, tomato. And one third of the tomato ketchups or tomato, uh, the, uh, uh, tomato paste, all we use in daily life, are coming out of Easter stone made by the use of Uyghur forced labor. It is huge. And in the more than 50% of polysilicon grid that is used to make the solar panel, and they're coming out of the region made by the use of Uyghur forced labor. And vinyl products were hard for floor and nearly 70% of the worldwide supply coming out of the region made by the use of Uyghur forced labor. And a cotton, my friend Dalton already mentioned. So these are the implications in our daily life, in our daily shopping, we are consuming these products with our pocket money. And that money ends up in China and uh, strengthen that regime who is committing genocide. And so there's, here's the implication. And we are directly or indirectly supporting that regime. We are complicit. And we are reminding that. And we are edu educating our Canadian public and the politicians. Hey, there is a problem here. And so this is our job. And of, of course, this kind of campaign and initiatives and uh, day after day getting more attention from public. And that upsets the Chinese government. And so by hijacking my the uncle in a hospital bed, and Chinese government wants to send me a message. Okay, your, uh, the most of your relatives are gone, and here's one, and if you do not stop, here's a consequence. That was the message. Otherwise, there's no any other the ways that Chinese uh, government can communicate with you. Why? And so uh, <laughs> Uyghur advocacy is really risky job and you have to put uh, the safety and uh, well-being of your loved ones at risk and on the other hand if we think back, think back and we are living in a free society because someone else before us paid that price to provide the safety for us and so we were activists and, uh, and the dedicated uh, person if we do not stand up and if we do not stand up for not only for our loved ones and for everyone, treat them equal, the Chinese government use it as a vulnerability and use against us. And if everyone scares, it is the win for Chinese government. So price for advocacy is really high. And so just I would like to remind that because of that high price and we have to be more vigilant in our daily consumption of products, we have to check where it is made whether it is made by the use of forced labor. And uh, in Canada, we joined uh, with the United States and the uh, uh, European Union to sanction four Chinese individuals and one entity. It is bare minimum. And uh, still we have a number of Chinese high-tech companies operating in Canada, functional, just like uh, Dahua is banned with conditional for three years to clean up all already equip, uh, installed equipments out of the service within three years time, still Huawei equipments in, in our the communication system. And the Dahua, our second largest uh, camera manufacturer in the world, still available maybe in this building, in the monitoring system, Hikivision, Sense Time, Alibaba. So all of those companies are directly tied up with the Uyghur genocide. Why? Because Chinese government uh, brought all of those companies and they create a kind of a platform which is called uh, Integrated Joint Operational Platform. And that platform gathers all information from the, the street cameras and the other monitoring and surveillance system into one hub, which is called iDrop. That system processes all the information and identifies and compares the stored information. For example, you a diamond. If he passes on the street, the camera captures his face and it compares all the, the information and his national ID card, 
registration everything in the system and it immediately triggers police <coughs> alarm to arrest him within 15 seconds. And the Dahua, Hekki Vision, those companies are part of that system. And the bare minimum, they contribute to Chinese government to issue a social credit system. Okay, what kind of products this person is purchasing? How much money he's using for travel or this and that? On the basis of those data collected from those high tech companies, Chinese government categorized people and they gave certain scores and restricted their behavior on the basis of that score. Or you can go abroad, you can apply to passport, or you're allowed to be on board. And everything is decided based on that social credit system, which is established by those data collected from those high tech companies. And so it is tied up. And so those companies are operational in Canada. And so how we can effectively ban those uh, Chinese companies. Actually, Dahua is rebranding already uh, the banned products by United States in Canada and the selling to the United States again with different name. And so there are scandalous uh, business are going on. And when United States uh, Custom Border Protection seized all products made by the use of Uyghur forced labor, and the Chinese government now starts to redirect those products to Canada or Mexico through a land border re enter to Canada, like the United States. Here. So there is a loophole. And how we can uh, correct that one. So there are a lot of uh, legal and the policy work before before us, and we have to complete it. We have to be more vigilant, and we have to engage with our politicians and the lawmakers. And we have laws, and sometimes, uh, for example, we are uh, the signatory party for anti-slavery convention and elimination of all sorts of racial political discrimination. Canada already a signatory state for all of those UN conventions. All of them prohibits racial discrimination and the importation of products made by the civil labor or child labor. But when it comes to implementation, we don't have that courage or we don't have that capacity to accomplish, accomplish our legal obligation. So if there is a lack of money, a lack of human resource or intelligence resource, we have to provide that. And we have to increase the capacity of uh, CBSA to do their job. And uh, this is one part of the, the campaign. Currently, we are engaging with our federal politicians and how Canada can learn from the United States and how we can allocate certain amount of funding to CBSA and how we can increase the human resources and how we can increase their capacity uh, to uh, collect right sort of intelligence information so that we have a, a certain ability to change that those companies uh, each step of supply chain where it is originated whether it is tied up with the forced labor or genocide and so these are the, the concrete actions uh, we are undertaking and we are successful in some, and it takes long uh, road. And another the initiative we are taking is we are using all legal tools just to uh, get uh, some institutions into action. For example, CORA, Canadian Ombudsperson uh, Person for Responsible Enterprise, that is federal watchdog organization established to monitor and investigate the Canadian big corporations and their business ethics, whether they are in compliance with our law in their overseas operation. And so we filed 14 complaints for 14 different big Canadian companies and 13 uh, complaints uh, uh, already accepted by CORE and it is in the process. And we filed a legal application against CBSA uh, for uh, failing to exercise their jurisdictional duty. And so we lost an in initial case and we are appealing that process is also ongoing. 
and also we are pushing uh, the legislators to come up with certain uh, kind of uh, tougher law to put a certain amount of corporate responsibilities for the big corporations in their overseas operation and that it, it may take some time and also we want to emphasize that the uh, putting ban on certain products made by the use of labor forced labor or forced labor is not enough and we have to have a legislation or certain measures uh, implemented uh, to ban the financial investment on those companies. For example, now the United States are uh, banned. Uh, many products originated from the East Turkestan, but there's no ban for financial investment. And so a greedy pension funds, just like Canada Pension uh, Plan, they continue to invest on those companies tied up with Uyghur forced labor, and they can sell their products somewhere else. And so how we can uh, close that loopholes, not only putting ban on those products, at the same time put restrictions on the investment funds to, uh, to invest on those companies. So there are a lot of uh, legal challenges ahead of us. And uh, I'm grateful uh, for our legal team and Yona, including Yona Diamond. Uh, the proud that he's uh, uh, the given his legal advice for us since almost two years, and from time to time we are seeking his legal advice, and we are working with the finest, the nine legal professions in Canada, and uh, they are helping to draw a roadmap what kind of legal advocacy we can pursue and how we can do that. And recently, one uh, international trade lawyer, Lyndon Dales. Uh, he uh, approached us and offered his volunteer service, and uh, we are trying to uh, use some shortcut instead of uh, waiting years for legal action uh, just to write the CBSA and uh, provide a documentation to them to re for redetermination of the tariff classification. Okay, these products specifically tied up with forced labor. So these products should be uh, redetermined in the tar tariff classification and a put ban on the importation list. And so I think this, if we are successful on this, uh, this is one shortcut that we can pursue in our legal advocacy. And we are waiting the result of that uh, legal paper already submitted to CBSA. And so uh, just briefly about M62 and what does it mean? And yesterday, it was a historic day, not only for our community at the same time, uh, for Canada and the Western democracy at the same time for China. And uh, the Canada, our parliament and elected uh, representatives spoke loud, loudly and clearly. And uh, they passed the motion. In a preamble, there is a clear uh, description of genocide in it and uh, all cabinet members voted and before the vote we had a chance to briefly talk with the prime minister and a number of cabinet ministers and we tried to convince them just abstention is not an option because it sends a wrong signal to chinese government when you abstain from voting it is still green light for chinese government it should be changed and uh, after the vote and we had a chance to meet with the Prime Minister again, and we uh, thanked uh, for his courage. And also we met uh, six cabinet ministers where we expressed our gratitude and all political party leaders. And uh, last night we had a reception and the five cabinet members attended and uh, nearly 27 MPs and the three senators and uh, the Minister of Immigration Minister of Transportation, Minister of Labor, and a number of other ministers attended, and uh, we also shared our uh, joyful moment. And the communities uh, came all across Canada uh, just to witness this historic moment. It is important because uh, the Chinese government, uh, since a uh, number of decades, 
has been pursuing uh, the transnational repression against the Uyghurs by offering a certain level of political or financial incentives to neighboring countries just like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, or Islamic countries and the Turkey. And uh, the many Uyghurs in one Wilson Center's recent report, more than 1,500 Uyghurs already deported back and uh, they are whereabouts unknown. And so this is a huge challenge. And Canada has witnessed that transnational oppression because one of our uh, the citizen of St. Jalil, Canadian citizen from Uyghur origin, and he was abducted by China in 2006 when he traveled to Uzbekistan in the third country and deported back to China and a sentence for life. And uh, so far, the Chinese government did not even allow a single consular access for the citizen. And that is a vivid example of transnational repression. And so Uyghurs are facing that kind of challenge. And so it is the obligation from the international law as part of the responsibility to protection doctrine to offer a protection for those vulnerable communities. And we have been working nearly five years try to convince our political party <laughs> leaders and uh, the government officials and uh, the lawmakers the severity of the situation and a number of committees issued report and they issued recommendations to the government for the resettlement of those vulnerable communities and at the end uh, at least one motion tabled and uh, they received unanimous support from all the cabinet members 322 against zero it is historic and it is unseen in our parliamentary history and so that speaks volume and now it is time for action and our organization and the world Uyghur congress we would like to work with the immigration canada and the global affairs we already committed and we already uh, expressed our willingness to offer all kind of logistic supports uh, to get those uyghurs safely back to canada and uh, it is important for Uyghurs, and uh, the 10,000 may not be a big number in compared to more than 100,000 refugees, but this is the first time in history that one democratic nation stood up and offered it is helping hands for those vulnerable community, and uh, it is a reason for Uyghurs to be hopeful. That provided a reason or the oppressed or a victimized community to be optimistic. That is important. We have to keep that hope alive. And in that regard, it is historic. And uh, the Chinese government also got the message. And in Bali, and, uh, two months ago, the Chinese President Xi Jinping acted rudely to our prime minister. You like him or not? Politically agree, agree with him or not? That is a totally different matter. He's a prime minister of Canada. No world leader should act in that way to our prime minister. And uh, I, I have a uh, really hard time to digest it. And it is dis disrespectful. And Canada should respond to it. And uh, in my brief meeting with the prime minister, I re reiterated, Canada must respond. Uh, the steel idol is not an option. Abstention should not be an option this time because that provides a green light. And when you say that we, as the government of Canada, we take the allegation of genocide seriously, blah, 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 that still sends the wrong signal to Chinese government. <clears throat> they interpret that, okay, our crime did not reach that threshold to be called genocide. So we have more room to go. That is literally what it means. And uh, I spoke with a number of uh, the advisor of prime minister. You should change that narrative because that is the wrong signal. And at this time, at least with that motion, it changed it at tone. It is a win for Canada. And we have to straight up our spine. Sometimes you have stand tall on justice. Even it is for China. Then we have more credibility. And so there are, lot, there are a lot to talk, and uh, let me stop here. And if there's a question, and then we can address. Thank you.
you both for, for coming here and telling us about the work that you're doing. I know it seems so difficult. You've both suffered family members in this. Um, I'm going to thank you for giving a really deep, ingrained idea of what policy-wise can be done domestically to kind of counter this. Economic sanctions, bans, doing research uh, against which things are coming from forced wages labor. I think it's very important. And also, um, look, and I think one thing that left me is saying it's great that Canada is resettling uh, leaders. That's very important, but that is not enough. That is a, it's a, it's a humanitarian gesture, but it won't end the suffering of those who are within China. So I, I those two things, those two points you made stuck with me. Um, so I would like to open the floor to anyone who has questions. Si vous avez une question en français, vous aimeriez demander en français, on nous pourrons le traduire. But perhaps who, I see Chris, <laughs> person of the CIC has something to say. Chris, okay, the floor well, is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming to, uh, to this event. Um, I'll sit down. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, it's a really devastating portrait that you you put out in front of us and uh, given us a lot to to think about and a lot to take action on. I, I just have two questions. Uh, some months ago, I read an article in the Globe and Mail about uh, the concentration camps that you you both described, and uh, it was it was pretty devastating, as what you've said, and and uh, impressive that the journalist was able to get access and get it really inside with the sources. So my first question is. Where can we get good information about the situation that you've described that's reliable and that, that we can count on? And, and I'm thinking mainly through journalists and, and independent organizations. I know you, you're doing your own research and I respect that, but I think that often people respect an independent uh, journalist's uh, uh, information. So I'd be interested in what you would advise us where to get information. The second question is, you talked a lot about what Canada has, has done yesterday and and your work, but what about international organizations? Is, have you made any progress in the United Nations to get resolutions or on the Economic and Social Committee? There's a problem, of course, that China's on the Security Council and has the veto, but uh, is there any, any progress you've made at the UN or other human rights organizations, international organizations, or indeed a coalition of countries that are supporting you? <coughs> Yes, it is very difficult to get uh, reliable uh, information from directly from East Turkestan. But however, you know, is quite a lot of uh, uh, international media reporters published. For example, BBC. BBC uh, made amazing uh, uh, report. At least three, three documentary. Used the, all used the Chinese source. Uh, and also CNN, Al Jazeera. No, it's quite a lot of international uh, media report. Besides this, also uh, some leaked document. For example, New York Times, Chinese cable, and later and leaked another Xinjiang police file last year, uh, May 24, uh, and more than 5,000 the detainers picture. Everything was. This old leaked document is published. And also, uh, as I said, since the 2019, some camp survivors. So far, uh, 12 camp survivors, uh, we know, they are speaking all to get the testimony. They are tell all the horrible story. Some is witness, uh, some is the teachers, first use the te uh, teacher in the concentration camp. Some is the uh, detainers. Uh, now is the Europe kind of five camp survivor, uh, two is uh, French, one in Sweden, two in Netherlands, is United States five camp survivors. They are all uh, they all stay in different of camp, but they all tell the same story and the horrible story. And also besides a lot of uh, international research institute, ASPI and uh, and uh, also. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in the institution and uh, the research institute, they have as a very very nice report as well. Uh, now it is the good enough resource to read it and the research centers. Uh, yeah, so of course this is not good enough because this is the only very very small part of the reality. 
but this is the oldest uh, report of uh, media report of uh, survivor testimony and leaked document. It is really good enough at least to describe what is going on for the Uyghurs. It is good enough at the Uyghur tribunal judgment even. You know, it is a uh, hundred thousand page document. It's a collected hundred thousand. But you can see is a Uyghur tribunal website. You can read a lot of personal testimony the people's what's going on. Yeah. And uh, internationally, uh, maybe 